Ethiopia, home to more than 100 million people, the original home of the coffee bean, seat of the African Union, and a nation whose roots stretch back into ancient times. Ethiopia has been heavily settled going far back into prehistory. Da'amet is the earliest known kingdom in this region, and was a contemporary of ancient Egypt and Nubia to the north. On the opposite side of the Red Sea, facing Da'amet, was the Kingdom of Saba in modern-day Yemen. These kingdoms appear to have had close ties, and some even theorize that they may have formed a single kingdom. According to Ethiopian tradition, this was the home of the legendary Queen of Sheba. She converted to the faith of Solomon of Israel, and bore his child, who returned to Ethiopia to rule as king, beginning a long line of Ethiopian kings who claimed direct descent from King Solomon. The Ethiopian church today maintains the Ark of the Covenant was brought to this ancient kingdom during this period, and is being kept safely there under guard for more than two and a half thousand years. For unknown reasons, Da'amat gradually eroded into several city-states and successor kingdoms around 400 BC. One of these, Aksum, would evolve into the first well-documented great power to rise in Ethiopia, and was able to unite the northern Ethiopian highlands beginning around the 1st century BC, where they established bases on the Ethiopian plateau and from there expanded. By the 1st century AD, they became a major player on the commercial route between the Roman Empire and ancient India. A notable Persian religious figure and scholar of the time regarded Aksum as one of the four great powers of his day, alongside Persia, Rome, and China. To facilitate this booming trade, the Aksumite kings minted large amounts of gold currency that became widely used and have been found throughout the Mediterranean to India. Around 325 AD, the king Azana converted to Christianity, making it the state religion, and was also the first state to ever use the image of the cross on its coins. Azana campaigned against the kingdom of Kush to the north, as far as the borders of the Roman province of Egypt, and is believed to have been the reason for that thousand-year-old kingdom's collapse. Included in his many titles were King of Kings, King of Saba, King of Salhen, and King of Himyar, which are all in modern-day Yemen, indicating that he either controlled or annexed these kingdoms. Or perhaps they were merely tributaries. The kingdom of Aksum would reach its apogee during the reign of King Caleb, who invaded the Arabian Peninsula in 520, with a vast army against the Jewish king Yusuf of Himyar, who had been persecuting the kingdom's Christian population. Five years after installing a native Christian viceroy, one of his own Aksumite generals killed the viceroy and declared himself king of Himyar. This general turned king, Abraha of Himyar, is mentioned in the Quran for his failed invasion of Mecca in the year 570. The rise of the Arab Empire would signal the decline and eventual demise of both of these kingdoms. Aksum was completely cut off from any contact with the Christian Roman Empire and the vast revenues generated from Roman trade. The kingdom of Aksum had a slow decline and began to contract back into the highlands. The kingdom of Elodia formed on its northern border and converted to Coptic Christianity and spoke a Nubian dialect, in contrast to Askum's Semitic dialect and script, used since the days of Da'amat in the 9th century BC. According to Ethiopian tradition, around the year 1000, a female pagan warlord overthrew the kingdom of Aksum, laying waste to the land, burning ancient churches to the ground, and hunting down all members of the royal family of Aksum. The last of her dynasty, which ruled over a much diminished kingdom, was overthrown by Maratakla Hymenot in 1137, establishing the Zegwe dynasty, although some scholars believe this dynasty was established earlier. The most famous ruler of Zegwe dynasty was Gebre Lalibela, who constructed 11 churches, carved straight from a single piece of stone, and attempted to construct a new Jerusalem as his new capital, in response to the capture of the old Jerusalem by the Muslims in 1187. Despite the piousness of the Zegwe, they had one thing working against them in the eyes of many of their subjects. They did not claim direct descent from the biblical King Solomon. And around the year 1270, they were overthrown by a dynasty that did claim Solomonic descent. This Solomonic line of kings ruled Ethiopia for more than 700 years, with a brief interruption during the 14-year Abyssinian Adal War, in which the Adal Sultanate was able to annex Ethiopian Abyssinia with Ottoman help only to be beaten back to their original borders by the Ethiopians with Portuguese assistance. 
The Age of Princes was a period in Ethiopian history from 1769 till 1855, when the country was de facto divided within itself into several regions with no effective central authority. It was a period which the emperors from the Solomonic dynasty were reduced to little more than figureheads, confined to the capital city of Gondar, and local warlords fought each other for supremacy. This came to an end with the reign of Tiwodros II, who re-established his dynasty's authority over the nation. However, this respite was short-lived, and he would commit suicide instead of being taken prisoner by a British expedition. The British would sack the Ethiopian capital and carry the Solomonic dynasty's crowns and treasure they had accumulated over the centuries back to Britain. Ethiopia's troubles were not over, and in 1874, the Ottoman-backed Ismail Pasha of Egypt invaded Ethiopia with the goal of creating an empire that would include the entire length of the Nile River. His sizable army included a large number of recruited American and European officers. The Ethiopians had been working hard on organizing and modernizing their military since their experience against the British and were able to utterly defeat the Egyptians in two decisive battles. The Ethiopian Emperor Johannes would die in battle against a Sudanese raiding force 13 years after defeating the Egyptians. His successor, Menelik II, would expand the Ethiopian Empire and defeat a full-scale Italian invasion. The technologically superior Italians were decisively defeated in a bloody war that they expected to be a casual affair. Forty years later, masterminded by the Italian journalist turned dictator Benito Mussolini, the Italians invaded again, this time sending an overwhelming force of approximately half a million men, 600 aircraft, and 800 tanks. Despite this, the war was still a long and bloody affair. The Italians gained little from the annexation and committed widespread atrocities against the Ethiopian population, which they never fully managed to control. Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie returned to Ethiopia from exile in England to help rally the resistance. The British began their own invasion in January 1941 with the help of Ethiopian freedom fighters, the last of the organized Italian resistance in Italian East Africa surrendered in 1941, ending the Italian rule. The Solomonic monarchy was fully restored after the war. In the decades that followed, Haile Selassie would begin to slowly implement democratic reforms in the nation. However, many blamed his grasp on power for the slow pace of modernization. During the Cold War, Selassie received the backing from the United States, and when widespread drought and famine hit the nation in 1974, the aged monarch was overthrown by a socialist faction in the military. They viewed Selassie as an agent of the corrupt capitalist West, and united with Eritrea, forming a larger chaotic state that was plagued by infighting and disastrously planned and implemented socialist policies. Eventually, Mengistu Haile Maram brought an end to the more than decade-long power struggle and attempted the creation of a state following the Soviet model, famines and genocide included. In 1991, as rebels closed in on the capital of Addis Ababa, he fled and was granted asylum in Zimbabwe. As an official guest of Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe, where he still resides today at the age of 80, despite calls for his extradition. This was followed by a transitional government in Ethiopia, which drafted a new constitution allowing any of the nation's ethnic regions to secede if they ever wanted to. Eritrea did so right away. And the remainder is the modern nation state of Ethiopia. Now there's a story in the Bible in 1 Kings chapter 10 that mentions a certain queen of Sheba who came to visit Solomon because she had heard of his great wisdom. According to that account, they talk for a long time, exchange some very expensive gifts, and then she returns home. But according to Ethiopian tradition, that's not all that happened. According to the Kebra Nagest, which is kind of Ethiopia's national origin story, the Queen of Sheba was named Makeda, and she had relations with Solomon during her visit. When she returned home, she gave birth to Menelik, who became the first king of Ethiopia. Menelik later goes back to meet Solomon as an adult and steals the Ark of the Covenant and brings it back to Ethiopia. The Ark of the Covenant is that golden box featured in the Indiana Jones movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. It supposedly held the Ten Commandments inside. So if you want to find the Lost Ark, you might want to start in Ethiopia. But let's get back to the dynasty. 
In ancient times, Ethiopia was known as the Kingdom of Aksum, and Menelik was supposedly the ancestor of their kings. This brings us to Za Hakala, the first historically known monarch of Aksum. He lived in the 2nd century CE or AD, which is when the Roman Empire was at its height. During this time, Aksum became a great empire. It lasted about 800 years, and we know the names of many of its rulers. All of these rulers were thought to be descendants of Menelik. The last emperor of Aksum was Dil Naod. According to oral tradition, he was supposedly defeated by an evil queen named Gudit, who had all the male members of the royal family killed. She was then followed by the Zagwe dynasty, which went on to rule Ethiopia for about 300 years. The first emperor of that dynasty married the daughter of the last emperor of Aksum in order to provide continuity. But in 1270, the Zagwe dynasty was defeated by this individual here, Yakuno Amlak. And this is where the Solomonic dynasty begins historically. Yakuno Amlak claimed that the last emperor of Aksum actually had a son who escaped Gudet's massacre and was hidden away. He claimed to be a descendant of that son and therefore the legitimate heir to the emperors of Aksum. Now it's impossible for us to know whether or not his story was true in a literal sense, just like it's impossible for us to know whether or not the ancient rulers of Aksum were really descended from someone named Menelik, and whether or not Menelik was really the son of some sort of historical version of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. What we do know is that by the time the Kebra Negest was written, Ethiopia was a Christian country, so it's likely that all these connections were invented in order to legitimize the rule of this new dynasty. So if there is any truth to it, that truth has likely been stretched and embellished, kind of like the story of King Arthur. But what we do know is that the Solomonic dynasty can certainly trace its origins to the year 1270. Now we're not going to go through all the emperors because there were a lot of them. Instead, I'm going to give you a quick overview up until modern times, and then we'll go one by one. I do want to point out this emperor here, Dawit II. He was a descendant of Yakuno Amlak, and he reigned during the Italian Renaissance. In fact, the painting you see of him here is a contemporary one done by a Renaissance painter. He's important because from here, the dynasty splits into several branches the two main ones being the Gondar branch and the Shiwa branch. These two names refer to places in Ethiopia where the various branches ruled. So after Dawit II, we get five more emperors from the main branch before the throne passes to the Gondar branch. We then get three more emperors before an emperor known as Iyasu the Great. Iyasu the Great was a contemporary of Louis XIV of France and established diplomatic relationships with several European countries. The Europeans used the name Abyssinia to refer to Ethiopia. Following the abdication of Iyasu the Great in 1706, Ethiopia entered a time known as the Era of Princes, when imperial power declined and most of the country was ruled by local leaders. There were lots of emperors during this time from the Gondar branch, but they were mostly just figureheads. This changed with Emperor Tudros II. His reign marks the beginning of modern Ethiopian history. He claimed to be a member of the Solomonic dynasty via the Gondar branch. He managed to unite the country again, but his hold on power was still somewhat tenuous. He therefore reached out to the British for help, but Britain refused to send troops. This made Tudros angry, and he reacted by holding several British citizens in Ethiopia hostage, including the consul. Britain responded by sending a massive show of force to rescue its citizens. They sent 280 ships from India, which included 13,000 British and Indian soldiers, an even larger number of civilians, 44 elephants, and 40,000 other animals. The force landed via the Red Sea, and took three months to march across the difficult terrain to the emperor's fortress. In the end, 
Tudros committed suicide, and Britain successfully rescued its prisoners. Britain did not stay to occupy the country, though, and Ethiopia remained independent. In fact, Ethiopia was the only country in Africa that was not claimed by Europeans during this time period, known as the Scramble for Africa. After Tudros, a descendant of the earlier Tagwe dynasty claimed the emperorship for a few years, but then he was defeated by Emperor Johannes IV, another descendant of the Gondar branch of the Solomonic dynasty. But his son, an appointed heir, died shortly before him. So after Johannes IV, there was a power struggle. Ras Mengesha Johannes, previously known as the nephew of the emperor, but after the emperor died, it was claimed that he was actually the emperor's son. However, Menelik II, a descendant of the powerful Shiwa, branch of the Solomonic dynasty won the power struggle and became emperor. He is the last confirmed male line ancestor of the Solomonic dynasty. Early in his reign, the Italians attacked Ethiopia, but the Ethiopians were able to successfully defend themselves. Because Menelik II had only daughters, the throne passed to his grandson, Iyasu V. However, Iyasu was never crowned. His father had been Muslim, and there were concerns that Iyasu might eventually come to support Islam. So his aunt, Zuditu, became reigning empress instead. Her first husband had been the son of Johannes IV. But because Ethiopia had always been ruled by a male, this man here, originally known as Ras Tafari, was made regent and heir. Now, even if you previously knew nothing about Ethiopian history, the name Ras Tafari is probably familiar to you. We'll get to that in a second. First of all, Ras Tafari Mukhanan is a member of the Solomonic dynasty via a female branch here. There was actually another person with a more senior claim through a different female line, but he chose to support Ras Tafari Mukhanan. So when Empress Zuditu died, Ras Tafari became Emperor Hale Selassie I, the most well-known emperor of Ethiopia and a dominant figure in African politics during most of the 20th century. He's also one of the few people in recent history to have an entire religion named after him. The Rastafarian religion developed in Jamaica in the 1930s. Rastafarians believe that Emperor Hale Selassie I was the Messiah, a reincarnation of God like Jesus. They also believe that blacks are God's chosen people, that African Americans are currently living in Babylon, and that one day they will return to Zion, which is Africa. Most people know a little bit about Rastafarianism because of Bob Marley and other reggae artists who were and are Rastas, or followers of Rastafarianism. But as for Hale Selassie himself, one of the things he had to worry about early in his reign was the Italians. They returned in 1935 for another attempt at conquering Ethiopia. This time they were successful, and therefore the emperor had to escape to Britain, where he remained in exile until 1941. But during World War II, the British helped Hale Selassie to take the country back from the Italians. So Selassie was once again emperor from 1941 to 1974.